Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Mind Heist, episode 78, with Muhammad and myself, Amin. Muhammad, how are the bags? Bags under my eyes. <laughs> no, I can't even. I don't even know. I don't even <laughs> notice these things. I don't even notice when, you know, someone gets a haircut, like someone that I live with gets a haircut. I wouldn't notice that. Which I'll tell you is not the best when you get married because, you know, women tend to be more detail oriented in that sense. They just sit there for ages expecting you to notice. Yeah. When. But it's just something you got to become good at, I suppose. It's like a skill, really. If you're bothered, if you put effort, then you start to notice things. What if you go in and you're like, oh, darling, well, you look great. What have you done? And they're like, I haven't done anything. We're talking about. Mm. <laughs> then that's a quiet so well, no, you could, you, could, you could actually play that. If you do that like once a week, you'll never yeah. get it like wrong because even if uh, she hasn't done anything, it's like, uh, oh, you're you, I don't always know, a you, winner. Just, you just look different. Must be, something. must be all those good deeds. You're getting the Noor, you know, the Noor is coming along yeah, exactly. nicely. Exactly. One thing I did actually, because uh, you know, you're saying you're very tired and stuff. Um, one thing I did uh, the other day, I slept early, which for me early was like 11. Okay. <laughs> so I slept at uh, uh, that time, but I, I couldn't actually sleep till one. But nonetheless, mm. I woke up at, uh, I woke up like for Sahur, right? Uh, so half an hour before Fajr or something, which is 3.30 over here. So I just slept for like two and a half hours. I woke up, I had um, Sahur, good, good Sahur, and I had coffee with it. And then I just thought, let me work, right? So I, started, I worked like three hours, good work, like solid work. Then I slept probably for four, four hours. And then I woke up and the whole day, it was like I wasn't fasting. It was like solid, like uh, fully focused, no headache, no lack of energy. I was doing like sales calls, meetings, this, that. Like It was good, bro. I don't know what it was, but I, I had this call a couple of weeks ago with somebody who's doing this like holistic health kind of thing, which includes a spiritual element. And he said that, you know, you've got to get those four hours of sleep between like basically half an hour after Isha, sleep then for four hours. If you get those four hours, you're kind of good. Like you only need those four hours for the most part, you know? And, and that reminded me of something I've, I'd heard years ago, but it's just about implementing that. But that's, that, maybe that is how, you know, I don't know if you, you've heard of this, but I always hear of the different ulama of the past and the salihin, how they would just sleep like four or five hours. And I, I even, I know shuk these days who, who also are like that. And it's like, how do they do it? Well, maybe that's how they do it. They sleep after they share, you know, pretty much directly. Mm. I think a lot of plays into it. I think you've got, you've got where you are in the world. And mm -hmm. obviously how, you know, light and how dark it is. Yeah. The, the length of the night and all. You've got the stimuli that you're always exposed to. So like maybe your phones, TVs, yeah. computer screens, all of that sort of stuff. Mm. And then you've, you've got whatever routine you, you need to follow. Like, uh, for example, I do shift work. So, you know, every week I do morning shifts, midday shifts and night shifts. And it's just, mm. oh, no, for you, it's nuts, man. Like, not good, man. Like, even if it was night shift, but regularly, that would be better than. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes you've know. got, sometimes you get three days to sort it out. But the first day off, you're asleep because mm. you just work. You've just finished work at like seven or eight in the morning. Yeah. So that forget that first day, you're not getting anywhere. And mm. then the second day you maybe get it. And then by the time you kind of try to fix it on the third day, you're mm. back at work anyway. So Yeah. So you know when you work night shifts, do you consider that ribat? Um I don't know. What does that mean? I mean oh, what does that mean? Ribat <laughs> is uh, when you're standing guard. You know, when you're on the front oh, lines right. and you're standing guard, uh, you know, through the night and stuff. Depends, Zahir, you know, depends what the, uh, what's going on. Sometimes, mm. sometimes I do something and I'm like, yeah, this is legit. And then mm. sometimes I'm like, this is an absolute waste of time. <laughs> Honestly. Mm. Yeah. But, um, but I guess depends, that's Zahir. like, imagine you're working for some kind of charity or organization, you know, doing good Islamic work, whatever. I would believe, uh, I would expect that if I was in that environment, I would get frustrated with some of the uh, inefficiencies or bureaucracy or the politics that goes on. Like, it's never pure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's never pure, you know. Um, even if, yeah. you know, whatever it is, like uh, you're in the military, 
I'm talking about Muslim army kind of situation, good situation. Even then it's like, oh, my commander said, do this. Yeah. I don't agree with that tactic. Kind of like, it's never pure, I suppose, really. Unless you're a self-made yeah, yeah, business yeah, man yeah. like me. True. <laughs> Lahi Barak, making sales calls in the morning. Good morning. It's 3 a.m. in the morning, Fajr time. Would you like to purchase my services? <laughs> you Honestly, bro, that, that's actually maybe something interesting to talk about because um, I've, been to, I've been doing sales calls now for, for my business for like six months now, maybe even longer than that. And it's been really good, very, really interesting from a personal development point of view, because I do not like talking to people generally, like, uh, especially like strangers. Like I, I actually enjoy, you know, sitting with close friends and talking sometimes meeting up and stuff like that, but talking to strangers, people that I'm not really on the exact same wavelength with, I'm not comfortable with that. don't really like it. And then it's also just the pure, uh, discomfort of trying to persuade someone to do something. Um, mm. but I chose to do it because I thought, well, I mean, my business needs it, but also it's like, this is personal development, like putting yourself out there to A, do something you're not comfortable doing and B, um, gaining that new skill by force, like forced practice. That is kind of real self-development. Like what's, what's more self-development than that? So it's been a really good journey, man. And uh, Alhamdulillah, for some reason, uh, I think when I'm given a technique or a method, and I just do it again and again, I'm good at it. So I don't, I don't think I'm good at anything naturally, but when you give me like step-by-step -step guide and I do it again, I, I can get good at it. So the results have been good, alhamdulillah. Um, I'm kind of getting tired of it to be honest, but the fact that I did something uncomfortable and I showed myself that you can get good at it, you can get more comfortable with it, that alone is good, man. Mm. Do you, um, like for me, like phone calls with, people like i hate it i can't have a phone call with someone and be in a room with other people so even at work where i'm you know every day i'm phoning people i don't know mm. i can't i have to go somewhere where there's not a single person in the room yeah you know i have to go to some quiet area sometimes i literally just walk outside and find mm. some quiet like street yeah. just to have a phone call mm. because i can't deal with people you, like, you feel like people are listening in yeah i don't i don't like it bro. even if there's like nothing it. to hide yeah, bro. Honestly, subhanAllah. It's very strange, man. But like once you're in that conversation, you forget yes. about everything else. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm bro, that's how it works. I'm there. I'm on Zoom. There's like one, two minutes before the time of the call. Um, you know, I'm there ready. Yeah. I'm I'm sometimes I'm half hoping they don't show up. Because you know, obviously some people do don't show up. Um yeah. and I'm like then then the, the sound comes on Zoom that they're here. And I'm uh -oh. like, okay, here we go. You know, but within within five minutes, I'm I'm there, I'm rolling. Yeah. And uh alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's it's been good, man. It's been good. And business is like that. It's like proper self development, man. You gotta just like it's like like I was talking to Muhammad, who's been on this podcast before, my partner, um, about a certain element of our like marketing funnel and how it's not quite working, that element of it, right? And I'm like, yeah, this, according to our data, like that's not working. And he's like, yeah, but we worked on this so much already. And, and the truth yeah. is, bro, like no one cares. Like you yeah. just got to do, you, you got to fix it, even though you spent so much time on it. If it's not working, it's not working. And that's like the persistence that you kind of sometimes have to have to, to get somewhere in business. Because I'm telling you, man, like with our newer business model, um, we were getting nowhere for like six months, like really getting nowhere. But but just since Ramadan is taken off like like crazy, like wow, yeah. like and I don't know. It was when I say unbelievable, I mean in the literal sense where we didn't believe that would actually happen. But Subhanallah, yeah, he, Subhanallah. Uh, uh, are, are you are you guys hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Send your applications to myhighspodcast at gmail <laughs> Yeah, if you want to do my uncomfortable job of getting on the phone with you, I'll be happy to replace uh, myself. Hello. <laughs> Mate, that's all you need. Just show me that you can have a phone call. You know, give me put your number in the application form and that's about it. I'll call you back. <laughs> yeah, man. How's what's the latest, man? How's your dad? Alhamdulillah. That's all I can say, bro. He's um Alhamdulillah. He's uh 
think he's obviously getting it. He's starting to feel the effects of chemotherapy quite, you know, um, what's the word? Strongly now. Mm. So, yeah, like, can't really do much on his own. I think a lot of, it's a strange sort of thing, isn't it? Because like, I, I don't know if like a lot of past injuries start flaring up again or sort of you just get aches and pains and whatever. Like it's just getting, all these like weird sort of like ulcers and, and eczema and like arm pains and numbness and all this stuff is all happening all at once. Mm. And obviously yeah. all, you know, chemotherapy, it's like just kind of destroying your body in a way, isn't it? To get rid of something. But yeah, it's a very um, intense process. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose so, that might mean that, like the whole time before when you weren't doing chemo, your body was like keeping those things together, um, mm-hmm. you know, without you really noticing or realizing. Uh, and then as soon as your body gets a bit weaker or whatever, that's when it comes up. Yeah, man, it's difficult, bro. So it's very interesting to, it's difficult and interesting to see like how mentally, you know, someone like that deals with it because there are a lot of things that, I don't know if it's a generational thing or like a millennial thing that, if I was going through that, then I'd think, oh, I need to take care of my mental health as well. And I need to make sure I'm, you know, getting some counseling or getting something to, mm. like, stuff like that just doesn't appeal to him whatsoever. Despite mm. the fact that I know that he'd need it, it's just not his style, you know? Mm. Um, I think it's definitely like a generational thing or what's acceptable or whatever. Mm. Um, and lots of things, lots of things were like, like I would think, okay, if I was in that situation, what would I be telling my kids? Mm-hmm. You know, what would I, what would be my like worldview? What would I want right now? Like, what would I want to tell them right now? Mm. And then like some of the stuff that he, you know, he tells us and he asks us, not, nothing wrong with it. However, it's like, oh, really? We're going to talk about that now? Like, can we just talk about something that's more important? Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so, but you know, everybody's different. I think, mm. I think bro, you know, you're, so, you're a more sentimental type of person. Which yeah, uh, I, mean, I think the average, you know, Arab dad or uncle, they're not sentimental types per se, usually. Mm, but I think but you are a sentimental guy. But there's also like this, I mean, I, you know, my father, as I mentioned before, he hasn't necessarily been actively practicing that long in the sense that, um, oh, I just don't think, he, I haven't really grown up with him like, being verbally conscious of Allah and speaking about Allah, you know, giving us those kind of reminders or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, um, he, alhamdulillah, he's praying now and stuff, but he hasn't got that sort of years of building upon this, yeah. this, you know, this thing where it's like God consciousness and tawakkul mm-hmm. and, um, you know, these things that we take for granted, actually, you know, mm-hmm. our worldview at the moment, you know, especially, you know, me and you at the moment, our worldview is often shaped by our faith in the sense that, you know, things go wrong. We think, oh yeah, this life's a test. You know, this is, the, even that, even that on its own, that this life's a test is something that takes a long time to truly adopt because, you know, you could just be told it, but if you haven't lived it, like for your life, you're not, you don't have those years of experience of thinking, oh, this has happened to me. Actually, that was a test. Or this has mm. happened to me. That was a positive out of it. It's, it's, um, yeah. diff- it's difficult. Mm. Um, it, it's also interesting when, you know, I guess when you get past a certain age, um, you know, as long, if your parents are still alive and stuff, there's going to be a point where you excel your parents in um, a certain area you know whatever it is if it's like your career work your whatever like my dad for example he's never really been in business so now I could say I guess I'm better than him at business or uh, I'm more experienced than him at business so he might ask me stuff about business like yeah. he's the one asking me and that's yeah. like a weird place isn't it definitely bro what's even stranger is like something I was speaking to him about was how I said, oh, I've just realized that you are older than your dad was when you're like my granddad was when my granddad passed away. Mm. That's such a crazy feeling, bro. Imagine like, you know, your father up to a certain limit. Mm. But then how do you think of your dad when you've reached a point where you're older than him? 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, imagine, like my dad is in his 60s now. Imagine me, you know, let's say, Allahu Ali, but let's say my dad passed it in his 60s. Mm. Imagine I was like 70 Mm. or 80, and I'm like thinking, Mm. you don't have a model for that. Don't have a model for that. And it's very strange because then at that point, you start thinking of your father like he was younger than you. (sighs) Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Because, you know, because now we look at our, 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 those that are older than us. Sorry, I'm really far from the microphone. We, we look at those that are older than us and, and think, oh, look at the decisions they made. They had the wisdom behind it and all this stuff. But then when you've reached a point where you, you're possibly now older than your father, you're thinking, oh, that was a silly decision to make. Or, you know, if I would have done it differently because, yeah. because you have got that age and experience now, whatever. Mm. Um, it's, it's very strange. It's very mm-hmm. strange. But isn't it like, I guess I see life maybe in four stages, right? It's like um, zero to maybe 13 or something, zero to 12. Mm. Then there's like 12 to, I don't know, 18, 20, whatever. Then there's 20 to 40. And then maybe there's just 40 plus. Mm. So like, is there a big difference between 50 and 70 or, or, you know, 60 and 80? You know, I suppose there is to an extent because you, you often don't feel old age, if you know what I mean, until you're 70 or 80. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose so. It's, I, I, it's made me think a lot about people's thoughts in that age. You don't think too much about because, because we haven't reached that age ourselves. We don't tend to humanize the people that are older than us in the sense that we don't know. We don't put our mind, we don't put ourselves in their shoes in the sense that we think, what could that person possibly be thinking now? Some of the most thing, some of the hardest things that have upset me in this test is just thinking about what my dad could be thinking about, you know, or picture, like imagining, God, if I was in his position, these are the thoughts that I would be having. These are the things I would be thinking. Um, and just the, the, the phenomenon of a life in in danger or a life like an actual you know a life that is sacred being met with its fundamental end or fun you know what i mean that's it's deep stuff bro Mm -hmm. um i've spent the past two days in hospital um not because of my dad but because of work every incident just ended up in hospital and like in a and e and in critical care units and stuff like critical care especially it was in there a lot was even in there today and it's just looking at people bro in their situations and it's just like spana any one of those people could be me like any one of those people this is what's stopping me what's stopping me when it's stepping out in the road and getting hit by a car or suddenly coming down with something or and then suddenly then everything puts it gets put into perspective that's why i think for anybody like alhamdulillah i'll say i'm fortunate to be exposed to things on a daily that put things into perspective for me Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of people that shield that shield themselves from that reality, or they only see it through a, through a screen. Do you know what I mean? Like the only the only time they see or hear of death is through this thing or the TV, and then they can just switch it off whenever you want. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important for people to step out and volunteer for things, get involved, see things with their own eyes, bro. Do you know what I mean? Not like through a screen or whatever, but like meet people that have gone through some stuff. Or this is why I think like visiting the sick is very uh, promote. I mean, Allah, Allah knows best. Allah has all the wisdom, but I can see the benefit of being promoted to visit the sick, yeah. uh, to attend funerals, to visit the graves, like just or visit graveyards. Sorry, but yeah, just to to actually expose yourself to the real deal of it all, because now like everything. Everything serious just gets trivialized and sensationalized through like movies and <laughs> and, and pop culture yeah. and stuff. Do you know what I mean? How, how many? If, honestly, but how many films do you watch where like, you know, the kill count is like 115 people? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? In a 90 minute film, boom, 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 death becomes completely desensitized. That's what I um, noticed, man. Like I watched the film like a couple of months ago or whatever. And like when people <laughs> die in the film, it actually hit me now because, you know, not as used to watching films. It hit me. I'm like, 
like I know it's a film, but like that guy has a brother, sister, mother, father. They said that. Trust like, me, it's, bro. It's Do we real. never think about that? We don't think about the henchman's family. The henchman has like half a second of screen time, but he had family, man. I'm yeah. like, what's his story? Tell me, yeah, pause yeah, the yeah, film. Yeah. What's that guy's story? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No, honestly, I think he- of that sometimes. Actually, there's there's henchmen everywhere. Do you know what I mean? There's henchmen with stories everywhere. How many wars do you have? How many how many kids are getting uh, you know manipulated to fight wars for people that have basically taken advantage of them? They have stories, man. Mm. How many people are on the other side of the world going through so much stuff that we just put as a statistic? They have stories. Like all these people have stories. It wasn't until you know when I when I um, spoke quite deeply about my dad's situation and I detailed his story that people started getting very affected by it because they knew what the story was. You know, every single person has got a story. Mm. And I think that's what I'm trying to say. Like, don't just expose yourself to numbers, statistics, and and the visuals of people. Expose yourself to their stories. The moment you read someone's story and then it's like, and now that life is in peril. Like that's, it's, you know, it's like making that person the main character of the film instead of just the side henchman. Mm. Because, because if it's a main character that's in peril in a movie, then you, you know, pulls at your heartstrings because you're attached mm. to this person. You know, you know, yeah, you know all yeah. about them, uh, and that's what you need to do to people, to real life mm. people. Sit with them and speak to them mm. and see what they've gone through because mm. everybody's gone, done something. Everyone's gone through something, and the benefit of that is it puts your life into perspective. I mean, th- that's one of the most fascinating things about podcasts, especially Muslim-run podcasts, is that. You know, how many revert stories do we hear? And pod- like Freshly Grounded, Mind Heist, Enfeed, all these podcasts, they've opened the door to a, a different side of people. Like, for example, we spoke about it before, but like uh, Sheikh Bilal Esed's uh, recent trial with, with losing his son and his brother. Like, you could have just heard that. You could have heard that in terms of like, oh, did you know Sheikh Bilal Esed lost his son and his brother? Mm. But when, but it was completely different when he came out and spoke about it. When he came out and spoke about it, I had to like park a car, man. I was getting emotional. Mm. And it's because you just realize that this person is a human being with a story. Yeah. You know? And, and it, mm. that's what it is, man. Putting things into perspective mm. is so important. Mm-hmm. It's like when I, you know, at work, actually, you know, sometimes it can get a little bit monotonous because you're, you know, you're dealing with, individuals while still thinking about the previous person you've dealt with and how that person affected you can impact the person you're dealing with now even though the person you're dealing with now is completely not their fault mm. do you know what i mean yeah yeah um, you know um so you know you have it where you go to somebody who's passed away or sudden death or something and you can either treat that person as a as a body or you can treat that person as a person with a story but it depends what makes it easy or harder for you you know, mm. there's been times where I've had to be very clinical and very, you know, because obviously a lot going on in my life, I've thought, let me just deal with this in a respectful and professional way in terms of not trying to find out too much about this individual because I just need to make the process easy for them. But there's been times where I've been stuck in a property with a body there for so long that I've had to like search for ID and search because sometimes when someone has been dead for so long, you need to confirm that it is the person that you think it is because mm. you can't tell by their face. And you, are, you know, I go somewhere, I don't know what somebody looks like. Wow. So I need to find something with their ID on it to confirm that, yes, this is, you know, John Doe or whatever, because just, just because he's in this property doesn't mean it's him. I have to yeah. make sure it is, especially when they die alone. So yeah, during those kind of searches, you're like, Oh look, he's, diary or mm. oh, look at these notes or these memoirs or these reminders he's left or this calendar that he's got or his medications on the table or this picture and this photo frame and then you start building this story and piecing up this puzzle and you're like oh subhanallah by the end of you're like subhanallah this person was a soul with a life with hopes with dreams with ambitions with a thought of what he was going to do tomorrow mm. like that's the mm. deepest thing bro yeah, um, yeah sometimes you know when people die and they've left something in a in a way that you know they were just about to come back. Like, you know, some people die on their way to the toilet and they've got like their dinner still on the table. Yeah. And they, they had no idea that that last, you know, those last few morsels of food weren't going to be eaten. You just, it's not, you know, just, just don't think about it. I remember wow. actually I had one, I, th- I, pro- I might have mentioned some of these in the past, but I remember having one that he just tripped at the top of the stairs, actually, on his way somewhere, I don't know, to the toilet or something. And his TV was still on. It must have been on for days. 
and like you just don't know like you don't know what part of your household could be the cause of your death like you just don't know <laughs> something so monotonous yeah. Achi, something so monotonous that you look at every single day could suddenly have a, a like a huge magnitude of importance to your whole life story mm. you know it's mm. incredible or like a, a location that you just take for granted every single day a place that you drive past every single day mm. could be where you know the the, the the basically the burial ground of yours you just don't know mm. right now you know statistically speaking you know people that die get buried but we don't know everyone can die in different ways but right now you you know your plot of land is waiting for you somewhere and you you might pass it every day and you just have no idea that that's what's written for you mm. and okay well like putting things in perspective man uh, you know, that's a blessing today, man because it's been uh you know, you know, the last time I prayed Janaza, mm. it was probably when I was at Hajj. Can you imagine? Yeah. yeah. Because I know like when I used to live near ELM, every single dhuhr there was Janaza, right? So you're praying that every day. Over here though, there isn't, you know, there isn't mm. Janaza. Uh, you know, actually, no, no, that wasn't the, the last, since Hajj, I prayed one Janaza. It was for some reason they prayed Janaza for the Sultan of Oman who died. Uh, and they prayed it here, even though he got his Salah and Janaza there. Um, but yeah, that's not enough, man. Like, and, and this is, it's like what you're saying. You've got to, the natural way, man, is to like mix with the society. And that's what Islam has for us. It has the Janazas. It has a Salah and Jama'a where you will pray Janaza there. You'll hear about uh, the issues people have. Like, like it was last episode, I think we talked about the area of, uh, like albir what is albir what is good and yeah. and uh, allah says you know giving to the these giving your money to these specific people and it said the the fuqara al masakin was those that ask for it so what about those that don't ask for it you're supposed to know that they're needy so you give yeah. to them without them having to ask right yeah. because it's embarrassing yeah. um so it's like that whole community thing man and that's why i'm you know, I guess last year or two, I really realized the importance of that. So as antisocial as I am, um, need, needs to be done, even if it's not for me, even if I still stick in my bubble, but for the mm. kids and stuff, that is a normal upbringing. That is the, the way to be, man. I remember years ago, I don't know if it's still running, but there was like this page called Humans of New York. I don't know if you oh, yeah, classic that. one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I remember like thinking, oh man, we need more of that. Yes. Like, yeah. How many people do you pass every day and you just haven't got a clue what their story is? Mm. Um, that, that's, this... that's phenomenal, bro. Like how successful that page was in terms of how popular it was, Yanni. It just shows, like you're saying, like stories is what connects people. You know, Definitely, whether it's, what, you know, whether it's um, I don't know, the stories of Babylon or whatever, or whether it's in the Quran or whether it's, you know, humans of New York that you see on Instagram. Like that's, that's powerful. That's what connects us. And if you, even if you think about it, marketing is storytelling as well. Mm -hmm. um, social media is storytelling. Like if you tell a story on a post, like that will get more engagement usually, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. that's what connects us, man. And it kind of crosses over to like the whole, you know, the, the racism in the world, the, 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 the fit and that's going on at the moment. Like if you, I, they've done experiments like this before, not that I can think of one right now, but you know, you sit some, you know, right wing or, you know, deep South racist individual with the very person he hates the most and just watch them exchange stories and exchange life and get to know each other. You break down so many of those barriers in terms of understanding mm. and empathy. And un you know what I mean? Like, mm you humanize somebody so much by just listening to what they have to say, because, you know, I've hurt just like you've hurt, just like everybody's hurt, just like everybody's had those feelings and challenges. Mm. You can't help but see yourself. Like I remember bro, like you ever, there's, there's films that I watched and stuff and, and YouTube videos and all sorts that I've watched when I was, before I was married, for example. And I, it never really pulled that the heartstrings, but now bro, like if I watch anything with kids, Oh my God, man. No, 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 no. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I've got two of my own. And I think you just cannot help but see your child in that, in that predicament. And it's been stuff like even the most 
child friendly stuff. Like, I remember, I, oh, I'm trying to think, like, even something as silly as like Finding Nemo. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Something as basic as that. Like, you know, I watched that when I was young myself. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's kind of whatever you know yeah. you just kind of move on can but you now, relate like, to it now yeah now you put it on and you're like oh that could be my kid are you and that like, kind of dad yeah bro like if he's if he's chasing his son all across the ocean bro i would chase my son all across the ocean mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the simple things like i don't know if you grew up watching the simpsons bro like i've been posting a few like simpsons things on my instagram and uh some some dude i i, I listened to on 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 some podcast um he said, oh, when I was young, you know, he, he's basically a non-Muslim guy. And he got a tattoo of Bart Simpson on his arm. However, yeah. he also got it in the shape of like an hourglass where it was like the, the top half was like Bart Simpson and the bottom half was Homer, like Whoa. his dad. Okay. He said like, he said like he grew up watching The Simpsons and like when he was young, he just used to relate to Bart Simpson so much and think that, oh, look, like his dad is such an idiot and this and this. And they, like now he's an old man. He's like, oh. But you know what? Now I look at Homer and I, I see I see myself in him and I, I relate mm. to him so much more. And I think that's so deep, man. I know it's really pathetic and it's a cartoon and that. But actually, it shows you how, like, you're a kid and you think, oh, look, that these adults are stupid and that. But then you're an adult and you're thinking, oh, look at these, these kids. They just don't know what's going on sort of thing. Mm. It's mad, man. It's just mad. I think it's phenomenal. It's like a phenomenal sort of mm. experience to just go through those mm. motions. Mm. I've been doing something uh, recently. I signed up for this course by The Thinking Muslim. Mm. They have a podcast actually as well. Um, and this course basically, it's, I think the founder of The, the, of thinking, uh, what, the thinking Muslim, he's like a uni professor, uh, international relations and this kind of stuff. So he knows about, um, you know, the history of political movements, this and that, right? So this yeah. course that he teaches, it's like a couple of hours every Sunday for five weeks. Um, it's basically s liberalism, socialism, and Islam, and the different ways these three ideologies um, see different elements. So every week he goes through a different element. One is like human nature. How do they see human nature? One is the state. One is the economy, etc. So yeah. that's been really interesting. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy to say it now, like compared to be before I, I had kids, for example, but I can't do two and a half hours. That's how long it is every week. So what I've been yeah. doing, which gets me like 80% of the information is I just read the slides because they give you the slides and it, it does give you, it's been really interesting to see the, you know, like some of the, you know, like the movements we see, whether it's, um, I don't know, like Trump's rise or like, you know, sometimes we're not American, so we don't understand the whole second amendment thing or um, some of these socialist leaning movements, like we don't get where they're coming from, the, the origins of this ideology. And often they don't yeah. even know where it comes from. So it's really interesting to see the fundamental beliefs that cause these movements to actually be where they are now. And to say like, why do people go to the level of, for example, saying that, uh, a woman has the right to kill a baby because it's her body and this like yeah. where does that come from and that, that yeah. was that's been really interesting um one thing i learned last week because last week was about economy is that there is a hadith of the prophet ﷺ actually saying that um something like it's like it's the haq of every muslim it's the right of every muslim to have uh, water um like land for 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 to, to for grazing uh, sheep or whatever and fire like like energy or light or something and so um some of them have taken this as a principle to say that the state should provide um the basics of like food and then uh energy or, or light or whatever and then uh I, I can't remember how they translated the grazing land thing into yeah today's context or whatever but um yeah that's pretty interesting as well i'm not gonna lie it was very uh the, the course is very hizb ish but uh, oh, right. the guys never mentioned that he's like has whatever but in the end it is what it is like it doesn't matter who where he's from what group but um that's interesting man like liberalism socialism and you know what's funny is that he mentioned like there's three phases of, of liberals you know in terms of their ideology it started with the classic liberals who are like the right wing today in america they're kind of classic liberals um yeah. And, and so they're liberals, right? Even though they call Democrats liberals today. Yeah. Now, the, the liberals of today or the Democrats, they are more like modern liberals. 
okay? But they're both supposedly liberals, but the right wing are the more pure, original, uh, classical liberals. Um, but they actually both are liberals, you know? They both believe that, you know, uh, liberty or freedom is the ultimate goal and people should be free. And the most important unit um, is the individual. And even, um, what's her name, Margaret Thatcher, who is a big liberal, she said, there is no such thing as society. Meaning, right. you know, we like, I don't believe that there's anything that when people come together, there is a unit which is important and significant called society. There is just the individual. And that, that, that's like what I'm trying to say is that the origins of the ideology, uh, um, uh, what is it, bro? Liberalize, li, 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 li. Liberalism, okay. <laughs> the origins of liberalism led to hundreds of years later, Margaret Thatcher saying something like that: "There is no yeah. society." You yeah. know, so that's been really interesting. And there's a couple of weeks left. It's a free course, and uh, good, I just thought, uh, especially if you just read through the slides, you get sometimes you get like a very quick like lesson on these kind of things, and it's just good to have knowledge of this. Yeah, know? definitely, definitely, bro. I don't know. I've been reading, um, bro. I've been reading books, man. Really? Oh, yeah, reading reading or listening? Yeah. Reading now. Whoa. Bro, stop playing video games, bro. Mate, I'm having a blast. <laughs> mm, great. <laughs> the, obviously, uh, you know, Wait, I've been going on about it for book? ages, but no, I, I, um, it's one I bought ages ago and I never really, it's Firas al Khatib's um, Lost Okay. History. It, yes, Lost Islamic History. But it's Very good, readable, bro, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a good Easy. sort of. I've never read every like you've always heard. Oh, look the Mamluks. Oh, look the Mohais. Yeah, oh, look yeah. the Abbas. Like you don't know when and where and how and what's going on. Yeah, like, what, you know, you just don't know the succession. Yeah. So reading it like this, it's very easy to yeah. read, sort of, and snippets of scenarios that occur. Exactly. Like, oh, actually, this is really good. I'm really understanding the yes. process and why yeah. there was so many like khulafa at one time and how yeah, that kind of. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's strange because. When you've got such a shallow understanding of Islamic history, you mm. think, okay, the Rashidun, yep, that's I get that. That's mm. all that's all Gucci, as they say. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, you've got like pre Ottoman times, you've got like, why are there so many Khulafa in the world? Yeah. Like, why there's this this or may, uh, uh, and and may, yeah. Mm. Why you got this and this and this and this going on? Like, what's can't mm. they sort it out? There's only meant to be one. But yeah. Nah, man. You need to look, you need to read the details, man. Yes. Because at that point, you understand that actually you, the issue is with, uh, with in me. Like, I yeah, now, yeah. I, and I do that all the time. And I realize, mm. like, oh, subhanAllah, look at what I do every day. I mm. judge people and I judge situations mm. like that without mm. knowing the history of why that person or that country mm. or that situation is yeah. in the place it's in, you know? Mm. And I slap that halal haram thing on it yeah without understanding how they've got to that point because yes. when you read how like the muslims of Fahas got to that point for example like okay when the when the umayyads were overthrown by the abbasids or whatever yeah but then there was like one umayyad ruler who mm. basically escaped and went mm. to andalus, andalus yeah and it, it wasn't it was his sort of sort of um leadership there that created the golden age of of of, of islam as we call it however Mm. You could, if you're shallow, you could delete that whole legitimacy because you could say, "Well, no, there was a khali there was a there was a caliphate going on somewhere else." So actually, mm. all of that was legitimate. Let's delete that from the history books. And we've got mm. nothing to be proud of over there. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. And the same thing with like, you know, this is deep territory, and I and I'm gonna say it with you know with a quotes, but like you've got issues with like aqidah in the sense like you've got you know ashari creeds and then stuff like that. Yeah, but you could, you could completely delegitimize every his, all, all our history by saying, "Oh, Salah al-Din was an Ashari, so let's wipe that out of our books." <laughs> do you understand what I mean? Yeah, Just because yeah. I do not, you know, you know, agree with the fundamental issues of that creed. However, yeah. it, you'd be the stuff that we all we because we don't know we we hold things to great yeah. light. However, we don't know that actually, based on our own principles and our own black and white understanding of things, mm. we we wouldn't even agree like we're contradicting ourselves you yeah. Understand? so and yeah and if you history bro tells uh, everything it tells a lot bro it will change yeah, your whole character because oh. it's exactly like you're saying like uh those who are very black and white with the whole aqidah thing um 
maybe for your personal beliefs, you should be like that. But when yeah, interacting definitely. with agree, other agree. people, it, it's important to understand some of these real life scenarios that happened. Like what you're saying during the time of the Mongols, um, Salah al-Din, when it comes to even Ibn Taymiyyah fighting alongside people he, he fiercely disagreed with when it came to Aqidah. Yeah. He still fought alongside them for the better betterment of the Ummah. Definitely. And, and then also the understanding that, um, you know, the whole Ottoman Empire... I mean, maybe, I, I, I can't say I this for got, sure. I haven't got there. I haven't got there yet. Don't, be, don't spoil it for me. <laughs> no, no. Uh, no, go on, carry on. Yeah. Um, like, maybe you could even say some of the biggest or most widespread um, empires, they adopted the Ash'ari Creed, for example. That's what was taught in all the uh, schools yeah. and stuff. That's what was encouraged. And also what you understand is different um, madahib and different aqidas, they are spread by politics sometimes like just the ruler happens to be of that persuasion and that's what will spread amongst people you know mm. um and a big thing bro two big things yeah that you get from this book like very very easy trends number one persia plays a huge role in islam like such so many great scholars came from that area and personally i feel like um i've always neglected that i didn't really know about that area uh, but it's it's a great it has a great history a great significance in our history it's just modern history where you know Iran is kind of feels separate from the Ummah kind of thing, that yeah. you get that. The second thing though is that the Shia have always been bad backstappers, bro. <laughs> like they've always <laughs> been creating problems. Um, uh. And and like I, I remember, you know, do you remember 2006? I think when Lebanon, uh, uh, Israel invaded Lebanon, and right. Hezbollah were fighting back, and they were doing a great job, you know, uh, re resisting uh, Israel's attack. And yeah. it was that time, like, I don't know about in the UK what the vibe was, if people were really into that. But in the Arab world, everyone was loving Hezbollah at that time. Okay. Obviously, for yeah. people that don't know, Hezbollah is a Shi'i organization. Um, and they were doing sick and everything. Everyone was ch uh, cheering them on. And so I was kind of on that vibe, to be honest. I didn't really know too much about the religious side of it. But I just thought, okay, great. Uh, I I'm, I'm down for anyone resisting invasion and all of that, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Later, a friend of mine started telling me about Shia and Iran and this and that. And I was like, I was resisting it, right? And he's like, he didn't even go down the Aqidah side. He's like, don't you know, like, this year they backstabbed us. Then, then they backstabbed. Then they, they, so it's like, it's been a trend, Ali, for hundreds of years. So, yeah, yeah. like, I was reading about, like, uh, oh, I can't remember when it started, but, like, the Hashashins. Who yes, were those sort of assassins, assassins yeah. Bro, mm. man. Like, they just came out of nowhere, bro, and they were just, like, messing us mm. up. Yeah, <laughs> they were Shia, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, it was, like, an extreme sort of... I don't even know if it was extreme. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't know. mainstream Shia, but, they, yeah. Yeah, because... Yeah, uh, yeah, but, but even that, the whole... That whole concept... Because it's not something I look into too much. But then when the history sort of explained the differences and how they arose and what the differences between them were, yeah. it was like, ah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense now. Mm. Now mm. I understand why it is and this and this and this. Mm. And man, it's just like, I've got like books now that are on my wish list that I just want to mm. read in terms of things. Because there's always, there's always, um, I think, you know, my books, when I started practicing, a lot of my books were like, not the self-help ones, but not necessarily the hard, hard knowledge ones. But like, you know, um, I don't know, like Journey of the Strangers and How to Get Humility in Prayer and, and these sort of things. Mm. But like, the stuff that is uh like all this history stuff yeah i kind of limited history just to like the time of the sahaba and the prophets oh uh, you know what i mean like mm. I, I kind of put it there and i just said oh after the the khulafa i'm not really mm. going to invest too much time in that because it was all mm. messy however that directly affects everything we're doing today yeah yeah and i guess the sahaba is the standard upon which we we aim to achieve and then everything yeah. that happened after that is uh the different ways that your effort to achieve that plays out you know uh, it's, it's like real life when real life hits you when reality hits you kind of thing that's what yeah. Uh, yeah, all yeah. the rest of, of of the time shows um actually on that topic um my wife just got this book today it's in arabic it's uh, um, this is a hundred people that changed the history of uh, Islam or something like that. And it's by uh, Jihad al-Turbani. 
and is is sick, bro. It's like imagine a hundred the story of a hundred different figures in Islamic history. It's got That's all awesome. of them in there, bro. People that you've never heard of, and people that you would definitely have heard of. These are the the sick ones. I thought if this book isn't translated, like that would be a great um, contribution to to yeah. translate this book. And the guy actually, this the guy Jihad Turbani, his uh, inspiration, his reason to write this book was, you know, that book that they always mention that. Oh, this Kafir guy, he put yeah. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi as the most influential. Oh. He saw yeah. that, right? And he said, okay, that's cool. He put Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi there. But he also put Hitler in the top five. He also put like Stalin in the top five. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so it's like, you know, what standards? I are, hate, bro. I he hate was purely sort of using, I think, influence as the yeah. criteria. But so this guy saw that and he's like, like, why is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi in the same like list as Stalin like and Hitler and stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's messed up. So then he's like, we need, we've got hundreds of our greats. So, so he wrote, wrote this book yeah, and I think man. he's doing, he's doing a video series, like one video for every person as well. It's all in Arabic, yeah. but if, if you understand Arabic, check it out on YouTube. Um, but yeah, bro, stories, history, like it's uh, it's def it's life changing, man. Life changing. Like if if definitely, man. This is what I've heard sometimes from from uh, scholars, teachers, etc. Is that if you're the average Muslim, you don't necessarily want to get into the ilmi ilm thing beyond your faradain, you know, beyond your fiqh and your basic fiqh of how you live, yeah, yeah. live your life, your tajweed for reading your Quran. Then what you need to focus on is two things. One is tafsir, that will really touch your heart uh, and give you that iman and that understanding of what Allah wants from you and, and uh, learn about Allah's attributes even through tafsir and through, through the Quran. The second thing is seerah. And seerah, obviously, is, it's similar, but for the Prophet ﷺ, understanding the, the, the traits of, of the Prophet ﷺ, the, the struggles the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ went through, right? But then on top of seerah, you could squeeze in like the seer of all these other people because, again, it's stories. It's something that it's not ilmi. It's not like scientific per se it's storytelling yeah. and the, yeah. it, i feel like that will change my character by learning those things you know more yeah. than other things you know usul al fiqh you know is great i find it quite fascinating but i don't know if it's going to change my character as much mm. as the kind of thing definitely man oh it's fascinating one of the th the last sort of part i read i haven't been able to read for a week now but mm. um Last part I got up to was like the Moriscos of Spain. Okay. Uh, that, I is think that that when those I people stopped, that were kicked out of Islamic Spain, right? Yeah. So this was a point where Spain had basically, that's it now. Like we've, we've pretty much lost, yeah, we've lost our foothold there. And the, but what happened was the Spanish king or queen or whatever, I think it was queens at the time. Yeah. And the, the, you know, Christians generally there, they allowed uh, Muslims to live amongst them or a population of Muslims to live amongst them because for economic reasons like you can't just kick out a bunch of people and then suddenly fill that gut fill that hole economically you just can't um so yeah they kind of like let these people that became known as the moriscos who were muslims to to live amongst them mm. however you know ideally back then religion played a very much more vital role like people believed in religion then if you know what i mean yeah, it's not like now we're like yeah. yeah like you got you know this day and age people don't really put it anywhere in their mind however back then it was a vital piece of life so they would essentially they basically put it to them like hey if you convert to christianity we'll give you like gold and horses and you know we'll look mm. after you sort of thing so i mean i don't know where you know like i said i need to read deep into it but they're like yes some of them converted took the gold took the horses and then they just carried on praying Islamically like at home and stuff. Like, they just carried on. So they took this. That's what happened. So they just like, oh, okay. Dunya and yeah, Akhira, sure. baby. And you can imagine these people are, you know, these Muslims, like you could say, you could say on face value, you'd say, oh man, you'd never do that. Why would you sell your faith for dunya? But then think about it. You literally had this country under, like this was your land in mm. their eyes. You know, this is generations of people that thought this was their land. Mm. Yeah, they're going to take what they can from people that are offering it. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? And, and so, but then obviously things turned sour because they kind of, the rumors spread that this was happening. So they clamped down on them, banned all of these religious symbols, you know, you couldn't mm. openly wear a veil, couldn't, couldn't have beards, couldn't, or maybe, I don't know about beards, sorry, but couldn't have like veils and stuff. And even in the old paintings and stuff about these people, you could see they, like, 
these were women wearing like the hayek these women were wearing like you know, pretty much niqabs and stuff but they were they were more so indigenous spanish or latino whatever you want to call it um uh um, yeah people as opposed to like arabs or berbers that had yeah. gone there mm. um you know so this was like real deal stuff um it's different now because now we play the politics of oh go back to your country whilst mm. there and then it's fascinating isn't it there the, the christians understood that these people were from this land right you know it wasn't like oh you're muslim go back to to the caliphates that are around the world they saw them as spanish mm. they saw them as people of this land however yeah. now bro with the racism and the islamophobia you get now the average tom dick and harry doesn't see you as a british citizen for example yeah you know? yeah. even yesterday bro like yesterday man i got absolutely racially islamophobically abused at work absolutely rinsed but <laughs> but taking him to court bro it's gonna be oh, it's gonna be delicious i can't wait <laughs> but anyway <laughs> um but yeah he's he at one point he turned to me he goes so what are you, you British? That, or something like that. He goes, oh, how long have you been in this country? And I was like, since I was born. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He goes, oh. He just basically didn't believe me or whatever. I, can't, I don't want to go into it too much. But like, that's what I mean. Like people assume that, oh, you are different. So you go to your country where mm. that is. Anyway. The difference though, I don't, maybe, I don't... is that in Spain, they were there for 800 years. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, Muslims have been in the UK for like 50 years. True. Yeah. True. But, but it shouldn't think, affect in... that one generation. It shouldn't affect that generation too much. I mean, We've logically, obviously. Here. Yeah. Logically, you know, you got to admit if someone's British citizen, they're British and you got to deal with it. Right. Um, that's yeah. logically. But logic, you know, is not always the most um, popular of way of dealing with things. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 But they 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 clamp down on the moriscos and they obviously no yeah. pr- private. I think they they and... used to randomly search houses and see if they had prayer yeah. mats and these kind of things. They used to they used to also like make sure that obviously they must have known which houses were the, the, those houses. So they'd make sure that on Fridays all of their house all of their doors were open, so mm. they wouldn't be praying Friday prayer, this sort of mm. stuff. But man, could you imagine? Like I'm sure you know we've had re- in recent times we've had situations like this. But man, like. These guys were living amongst, like, you know, in, in, under this leadership, and they had to like mm. imagine teaching your kids the Quran mm. in secret yeah. and telling them, "Listen, I'm teaching you this. Don't say it. You know, don't say it outside or whatever. Don't, yeah. ha- you know." And that was for years. That was happening. Yeah. Um, but uh, you like, know, eventually, sounds like uh, China in 2020. Bro, exactly, man. <laughs> but um, you know, eventually, you know, unfortunately, it just. It, they basically did a full on expulsion. Mm. Um, and what, oh man, what upset me so much was like any kids that were under four were taken off them. Bro, my, my child, my son is three years old, man. Mm. Like, and one, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the human, because if I read this before I had kids, I probably wouldn't really, I would have, you know, glossed over it. Oh, it's history. It's in the past. But like immediately I was like, I let, I let them take my kid off me and kick mm. me out across the ocean. Do you know what I mean? I get sent from Spain to Morocco and mm. I have to leave my kid. Mm. No, 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 no. Like, mm. oh my God, I just could not compute mm. that. That is what, and you know, this is it, bro. The Ummah is one body and that body extends, uh, that, tra- that body transcends beyond time. Mm. It's not just the here and now. Yes. It's the suffering that they went through in the past. And this is, because actually we're all going to be raised together. You know, that's it. And all the Muslims of all times will be in Jannah bin Do you understand? Like in, of mm. all times, not just the ones you got now, the ones that suffered back then, yeah. the ones that will suffer in the future. We're all gonna, we're all in it together, you know. Mm. In the same way that there's, a, there may have been a Morisco individual that made du'a for us. Now mm. we can make du'a for them. Yeah, you know? mm, their judgment true. is yet to pass. We can Allah go and say, "May Allah, Allah yarham them," because that's it. They're, le- they're mm. legit. They yeah. experience stuff, and they have yet to be judged. Mm. Bro, they're gonna come yom al qiyamah. They're gonna look at me. They'll be like. McDonald's, bro. <laughs> cheesecake factory, bro. <laughs> You're soft. <laughs> You're oh, soft. <laughs> man. You know what we had to go through? Well, like, it's deep, man. It's deep. And you know what? It does um, put things into perspective. No matter how much you're going through, no matter what tests you've got, like, oh, with everything going on with my father and the 
you know, a few days ago, I had a few days where I was just like, oh my God, and there's so much I need to sort out and do, you know, financially, spiritually, everything. Like, and that was part of me, like stopping, like putting away any distractions I had and just being 100% goal oriented. Like everything I do has to have some sort of visual benefit to it. Otherwise I'm wasting time because I regret wasting so mm. much time before. Very masculine, bro. But when push comes, when push comes to shove, you realize, Akhi, you're like, yeah. oh my God, look at all this time I wasted. I could have really got myself, I mean, Qadr Allah and everything is Qadr Allah. Um, but you can, you have to learn from your mistakes, you know, and without regret, you would have no remorse for sins and times wasted, you know. So you have mm, to, okay. you have to have some level of reg- regret to, to learn. Yeah. However, yeah. alhamdulillah, I, I accept that I'm in this position now, but still. Mm. Yeah. So because of that like oh it became like a, I don't know how it says in english but it's like a rumma you know what i mean like a rumma over your head like um i can't describe it but like almost like dark clouds of like oh my god i need to sort this out i need to figure this out i need mm. to do this i need to do this. um and then suddenly you just get reminded dude like people went through so much worse and they are dead now mm. <laughs> you know like for example these these mariscos and there's people that have gone through much worse than them Mm. It's like people went through so much hardship in life and they are, their mm. test is over in that sense. Yeah. Like, what is this to you? What is, what is yours compared to theirs? Mm. You know, and reminds you me are- of that hadith where the Prophet let me said, the people will come, Yom al Qiyamah, who had the most difficult life, the most difficult, difficult life. And as soon as they, you know, enter Jannah or they just touch Jannah, they'll say, well, we didn't have any problems in life. Like it was, no, sorry, when they enter Jahannam, sorry. Oh, then yeah. When yeah, they yeah, touch yeah. Jahannam, they'll be like, yo, that was nothing. The dunya, that yeah. was nothing. Yeah. And, and I think the people that enter Jannah, they'll say, yeah, like they forget about the hardship, basically. Yeah. I think I've, I've come across um, a lot of people that have struggled with some concept of Jannah and Jahannam, mm. uh, which personally I've never, you know, handled it. I've never had any issues with. The understanding of Jannah and Jahannam. I like I, I fully accept that Jannah exists. I fully accept that Jahannam exists. And the not the extremities, but the the relative extremities of either two. Like you've got extreme and incredible bliss in Jannah, but then extreme and incredible hardship in Jahannam. Some people can't rationalize that, but I f- fully can, alhamdulillah. However, what I'd like to remind people is that it all goes back to exposure again. If you expose yourself to stories. And you see, like, some people think that they read about Jahannam and they think that is crazy harsh or crazy. But then if you apply the fact that you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, then you know the person that goes to Jahannam was deserving of it. Akhi, there are stories and there are things going on right now, right this second, right this second, of people that are doing the most horrendous and heinous crimes, you know, um, to the most innocent of people, you know. Mm. To the most innocent of children, even, you know, mm. um, and I don't want to go details. I don't want to go into, you know, but just sit and use your imagination. Because sometimes, you know, the stuff that you hear in the news is the tip of the iceberg of stuff that's out there. Yeah. You know? and, and the, the reason news, why bro, sometimes it's very bad. Of course, bro, there's stuff that goes, the stuff that's going on in Brighton today, mm. for example, that I've seen with my eyes. And mm. I check the news. I'm like, oh, I wonder if the news is reported on this. Like the local papers, I'm like, and I said to my colleagues even today, I was like, man, they're missing out on such major stories because they just don't get reported. People don't know what's under their noses. So that's what I'm trying to say, Akhi, this. Sometimes, Wallah al often actually, often, Wallah al when you know the details, Akhi, you think, you know what? That person deserves those, those vivid descriptions of Jahannam. I'm like, that person deserves that mm. fully. You know, I would not, obviously, I would not think crime twice. The is not uh, acknowledging Allah. Uh, after all that Allah did for you, mm. not even acknowledging Allah. Because the way I also rationalize it is that, you know, like as for me, like I can't claim where I'm going, right? But yeah, just, of course, just of somebody course. who's not Muslim, right? They're not Muslim. What, what I always imagine is they're going through life and kind of like when I was younger and I wasn't taking life that seriously, therefore I wasn't taking Islam that seriously. I did get indications or reminders or that kind of thing. Like sometimes I would just feel down or I would feel, uh, I go to a certain place, just feel evil kind of thing. 
And yeah. I feel like that was that was what Allah put, that was my fitra basically. That was yeah. my fitra calling me to remember my Lord. And what I imagine is that the the kuffar are also getting this. Every now and then, you know, whether it's every five years, every two months, whatever, yeah, they're man. getting these moments that are caught, that's their fitra awakening inside them to heed the call or not heed the call. And if yeah. you get that every year for 80 years of your life and you never once answered that call, then, you know, the, the, the message has been sent in a sense, you yeah. know. The, the, it's, it's insane, Akhi, because the existential crisis that derives from these sort of emotions without a creator or conscious create, you know, being conscious of your creator, I can't understand. Like, I, I mean, it's all masking, isn't it? Like everything that somebody who isn't conscious of Allah does must be to mask the feelings that they have, because you can, you can address that sadness in your heart by knowing that this haq, this truth fits in this sadness. So I know, exactly what that is you know i know exactly what that sadness is i know exactly what it means and i know the truth behind why i'm feeling that way mm, yeah but for somebody who hasn't got those truth that everything they cover it up with is a lie is a fad is yeah. a it's, mm. it's not real you mm. know like so when you're when i'm feeling you know if it was me hypothetically if i was feeling down then i say let me let me play some music and cover that up uh it's not like that hasn't solved the problem because that isn't what my thing is, yeah. but it's distracted me from it. Or let me, you know, mm. let me be promiscuous and sleep around or fill my, you know, fill my belly with alcohol or whatever it is. Like all of these things that are meant to be, mm. they're not cures, they're distractions from what the real thing is, yeah. which is your lack of mm. God consciousness mm. and your lack of knowing what your purpose is. That's like, what love is, I suppose. Exactly, bro. Even these things, like even these books, bro. Like, yeah, why are self-help books so popular? I can't read Obstacle is the Way without being God conscious. Because yes, you know, the individuals that wrote that book wrote that book, but there's, there's people that are atheists that read that book and think, oh, wow, that's powerful. It can't be powerful to you because there's no way that you can actually uphold that concept of, this this obstacle is my path to success without knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed that obstacle for you. Do you understand what I mean? It's it's very difficult, man. Mm. And you know, a lot of authors though, you know, like for example, the author of that book, he speaks about God occasionally. Um, so I think he, you know, believes in, in a higher being in that sense. But for somebody who doesn't at all, um, it's very it's just it's a very dark place to live. And I think, you know, ego becomes part of it and your 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 religion becomes debating people and proving people wrong and that just feeds into your ego because you've got no limiter anymore you've got no barrier to say oh you know i shouldn't have a mustard seed of 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 arrogance in my heart so i need to watch myself can't be arrogant i need to be making these debates for the sake of allah i need to be making these debates sincerely you know you're always checking yourself if you've got no checks and balances in place you just you become mm. a dark human being you know Internally, externally, there are things like social pressures, like shame, uh, like, uh, you know, laws, for example, that can stop some levels of immorality. But yeah. internally, actually, there is nothing stopping somebody internally from watching something awful or being into something awful. Do you, know, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, like, yeah, there's no checks and balances of, for somebody. Then they can be, they have the ability to just be a insanely dark person inside yeah. and into some sinister things i mean you know bro how much uh harm you can cause somebody and not even be doing anything illegal right and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the basic level like something just an example came to my head of somebody imagine you've spent a hundred two hundred thousand pounds on a house and you're trying yeah. to rent it out and somebody comes to rent it they pay one month's rent yeah. Month two, they don't pay. Month three, they don't pay. Month four, they and somehow they do it so they can't be kicked out of that house. Yeah. So now this house you paid for, this guy's yeah. taking advantage. He knows his rights because that's what these people do, yeah, and they they just they just uh, take advantage of your home. They live in it for free. <laughs> I yeah, mean that's yeah, that's yeah. not even that like evil, but it, it is really evil. It, but it is yeah, it's this it's the the darkness of that self entitlement, yeah. and that's not even illegal, no, apparently. Of no, squatters' rights. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that. honestly, like, even if people break into a building, you know, derelict or an empty building, whatever, bro, like, you can't even, like, 
you it's a long long process to kick people out it's yeah anyway um yeah man the dark like i used to really like i don't know i must have been naive when i was younger and i didn't really believe that people were could be so evil like in them i always assumed that because i i never had i mean you know i've done some bad things in my life i'm sure but i have i didn't ever consider myself having this you know capacity for evil you know when we see evil we're like oh look at these movie villain kind of evil stuff mm. didn't really believe in any of that mm. because i thought everybody was inherently good and they make bad decisions or they the consequences and stuff takes them to to that yeah. place man i've been proven wrong many times man there's mm. just people that just do malicious and horrible stuff there are there are elements of that that maybe because of their upbringing or something they've been for or whatever however they make a conscious choice to say this is my upbringing i'm gonna use that and lash out on this or whatever but some things you just can't make excuses for because if we could make excuses for everybody then jahannam wouldn't exist mm. do you know what i mean because allah is more just than me do you understand what i'm trying to say so but allah is also more merciful than, than okay, us exactly. but he still made jahannam <laughs> exactly mm. exactly um but you know it's 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 fascinating actually. it's it's all about exposure I say it again just mm. like i said it in the beginning expose yourself to the real to, to real things man. switch that tv off or get off your phone like even like you know i mean like the news now i check in on the news maybe once a week mm. i used to check it every morning every mm. few hours would you agree that the news isn't real isn't reality yani um so based on the based on my experience because everything outside of what i see i can't judge because i'm not there to see it however based on my bubble of my city that i'm in you know and i read the local paper and i and i and the local paper any criminal job or any big event has happened and they have an opinion not even an opinion piece like an article on it you read it and then i look at the comments and i see that's what the public make of that situation mm. But I compare it to me actually being there on many mm. occasions. It's not like, because uh, a lot of people that aren't in the jobs that I'm in and then, you know, emergency services and all sorts, they don't get exposed to truth as much as that, the people that, you know, in my position do. Because how many things have been reported on the news that you've directly attended? Do you know what I mean? Like mm. you as an individual, how many people, how many things have you read in the news that you've directly been there from start to finish? You haven't. Like people don't really get that opportunity. However, it's happened to me on so many occasions that I just see now how warped the media can be. Like, yeah. there's been times where, where, like, something has just been completely nothing and they've made it into something it's not. Yeah. Um, something could be, like, a medical thing and, it can, and then they turn it into something sensational and criminal and a conspiracy. Something could be a big conspiracy and a crime and stuff and they've dumbed it down completely. Yeah, because it doesn't suit an mm. agenda, or they don't have the full facts, or mm. whatever it is. So, mm. yeah, man. Um, I, but that's another thing about social media. Although social media is full of, it is full of fake news. It is because how many times do you just see a screenshot of something and they say this is uh, this man <laughs> did this and this, you know, and he. You know what I mean? Like, there's just be some story that has been yeah. slapped onto a picture that's got nothing to do. Oh, do you know who this man is? Well, this man, one day, he found a million pounds. And yeah. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. all this stuff. And then you, like, you reverse image search that. I always do. I always reverse image searches to yeah. see where the oldest version of that photo is. And it's like, no, this is just like a stock photo from God knows where. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think, I think are, the news is... It's very negative and probably what yeah. you see day to day is also very negative. So uh, maybe neither is like a proper representation of reality, right? No. Um, maybe what I like when I speak to people pretty much every day, um, they're always coming to me saying, yeah, I want to do this amazing thing. So that's yeah. all positive, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with exposure, bro, mm -hmm. with exposure, real life exposure, it gives you the time. It doesn't give you the 30 second snippet. Yes. It gives you the time and the depth to, yeah. sit, to sit with both victim and perpetrator, with both, you know, vulnerable and, and, and the abuser, with both, with all these different types of people. Um, you know, any news story has its good guys and its bad guys, right? Um, but being in the real world allows you, especially speaking and engaging with these people, allows you to see, you know, 
for example, one thing that fascinated me was like, you know, okay, when the COVID thing came about, um, I'm not passing judgment here. I'm just talking about the real life facts. When the COVID thing came about, they, uh, the government suddenly housed all the homeless people in, in, in hotels and stuff, right? Mm. And um, everyone was like, oh, see? It's as easy as it can be. Just do it overnight. Um, of course, every single homeless person wants, all they want is a home. Of course, that's the case, right? Like that is a very, you know, very understandable assumption. Mm uneducated yeah yeah all these homeless people all they want is housing and they're once you give them that they're fine bro every day this week i've just been going every day since this started i've just been in and out of these hotels that they've housed and i'm not saying number one i'm not saying that all homeless people are troublemakers definitely not no way you know the vast majority of homeless people i've never ever spoken to them or engaged with them because i never had to part of my work because they just stay out of trouble and stuff yeah however actually Oh my God, do a minority make it horrible for the for the majority? Oh my God, every single place is trashed, man. You know, with drugs, alcohol, people just fighting and, and bloodshed, and it's mm. it's horrendous. But mm. but of course, every homeless person just wants to be housed, right? But mm. I'm not saying that that's the issue. What I'm saying is, on top of that, is that there's also stories behind these people. You know, the ones that are being awful, the ones that are behaving badly. However. People just need to think there's a lot more nuance to every single thing you hear. Yeah. When you see something as plain as, oh, look, let's just house all the homeless people. It's as simple as that. That's not mm. nuanced, you know, because you go and sit with people and you be like, oh, you ever been in trouble with the police before? Oh, what for? Oh, mm. well, you know, I did this and it. Oh, but you're homeless. Like automatically in my head, you're a victim. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Like you're a victim of the system because the life you live in. Well, actually... I made bad decisions in my life or this is what ended up happening to me. I know, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to pass no judgment here. I'm trying to just give a bit more nuance to certain situations yeah. that people don't necessarily think about, you know? Mm. Um, it's like the whole thing of the bully in school is the victim as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. But also everybody has choices to make and everybody has choices to be accountable for. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing you have, like, <sighs> Have you ever been, it's, have you ever just seen that people that you know are individuals, but people that you see in the street are part of the mob? Have you ever had that phenomenon where you've, of course, like, yeah. you box the people faceless, up into categories? Uh, masses. Yeah. yeah, faceless masses. You can box them. And it used to happen in school a lot. I remember this, from, like, really coming to terms with this back at school where I used to think, oh, that person's part of that crew, and that person's part of that kind of clique. And that person's part of, but, like, my, me and my friends, like, we're just individuals like yeah, we, yeah. we're yeah. like we, we're I can't unique. Put my, yeah we're unique i can't put me and my friends in any sort of box yeah however i know that to those faceless people they probably saw me and put me straight in one particular box like it was very uh, easy for them yeah but that's what we yeah. do man like people yeah. we don't know we box them up into certain mm. categories yeah yeah but, and that's also the whole uh, racism thing i guess it's like mm -hmm. Walking through your life just seeing everyone putting everyone in a category and applying the stereotype label to it yeah. Um, that's how it kind of goes. It's like, even if uh, all of that group tend to be criminals, or no, even if, yeah, 90% of those, that group of people are criminals, what about the 10%? Like the guy you're looking yeah. at, that specific guy you're looking at, you is he the 10% or the 90%? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember once I had to watch, um, sometimes you have to watch people that are, you know, prisoners essentially, because they may have uh, made threats to harm themselves or you just have to watch them for their own safety basically okay but i remember once like sat down watching this guy he just started talking to me he started talking to him just, and then in that position like those barriers are kind of lifted because now i'm like oh, this guy's telling me a story now i'm sitting there like a lot of those best of what's true and what's false yeah man i felt bad man i was like oh my god this guy's been done dirty so many times by mm. people by the system by do you know what I mean? a lot of things and he's just like rah and then and i remember this so vividly actually because i was sitting there for hours with this guy and then and i remember i took I, so we do it in like shifts so i'll be there for a few hours someone else will be there so i must have taken over somebody and then i was there for a few hours obviously getting to know this guy's story anyway when I finished, someone else came and took over me. I went back to the station and I saw the guy that I took over. 
And he looks at me and goes, oh, how was he? And I was like, mate, he's, he goes, oh, he doesn't shut up, does he? Like, <laughs> it's, as in like, he didn't like the guy and he completely hated it. And he just couldn't connect on any level. Right. And he just thought he was chatting absolute nonsense. Whilst right. I was sitting there like, man, I'm so, like, I'm having a, a crisis of, of, do you know what I mean? Like, like crisis of career right now because I feel so bad for this guy. Yeah. Um, and it just, it shows like people, some people close that, close that side of them off completely. Mm, They're not interested yeah. in knowing people. Yeah. They're not interested in that whatsoever. Mm. And that is a choice. Yeah. Mm, that is a choice, bro. And it's a lot of things, mm. man. This, you know, and it goes deep, it goes deep into human nature and it goes deep into, man, as, as early as time, Mechie, like with, with, you know, with the sons of Adam, you know, mm. the original sons of Adam, Cain and Abel, you know, it's, it's something that's always existed, Mechie. Mm. Whether yeah. it's, you know, it's something that maybe we can never defeat because it's in, it's almost like in our veins, bro. Mm. Yeah. But it's conversations that need to be had and, and people to make conscious decisions about a lot of things, you know? Yeah. Good episode, bro. Let's wrap it up Sorry. Here, inshallah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, everyone. Jazakum la khairan for listening, for getting this far. Uh, go to mindheistpodcast.com if you want to send in any comments or questions or suggestions. Um what else is though? Um, um, oh, I want to shout out my 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 wife's getting really um, what's the word uh, consistent and stuff with her podcast. Uh, she's been on Mind Heist before a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yours truly, Hidden Looked. It's on all this, all the all the podcast platforms and stuff. For a lot of sisters, it's I think it's really beneficial because there's a lot of stuff that we can't talk about. Like we just won't. Like, I mean, we will talk about it, but we'll be like. I'm just too masculine kind of to talk about. Yeah, this look at these well. beards, man. I mean, my beard's a bit pathetic at the moment, but you'll get back to where it was. <laughs> but um, inshallah. But yeah, you know, I appreciate if, it, if any sisters are listening. Um, Yours truly, hidden ucht, yeah? Yeah, if you, yeah. Uh, if you go on um, uh, Instagram or you just search that, you should find it in there. Inshallah. Um, and I think, yeah, it's good, it's good for sisters to be able to have a bit of that as well, storytelling with each other and, and, and doing it with each other because not to pass judgment. I mean, we all do it, mm. but some, I've seen some, some women that have just been at each other with judgment, like deep, you know what I mean? Like the, like some women just judge each other in such harsh, harsh ways. It's phenomenal. Mm. Um, but obviously some guys do that as well, but I think it's good inshallah to keep those stories flowing and keep humanizing each other, you know, understanding each other's struggles and each other's stories. Yeah. So yeah. Um, what else is there? Oh, I released a wallpaper pack yesterday, man. I'm very is that happy phone about wallpapers. This. Yeah, I had. I've always had a lot of people talking about, oh, can we get wallpapers and blah blah blah. So okay. I released one yesterday. Uh, it's on. It's forty phone wallpapers that I've designed. Forty. All forty, man. Well, uh, obviously, it's it's collection of all my works. Yeah. A lot of my works, but like, because yeah. f- usually people try to screenshot and like enlarge and it just looks awful yeah. so i've actually done it so that i've created them in the format for phones yeah. for smartphones put them all together it took me a very long time to put all together however mm. it's up there now it's permanent if you go on my instagram and click the highlight uh you can download your pack in mm. there uh mm. plenty to to choose from and stuff and um yeah where man, do we find it it's just go on aki tweets instagram Okay. I've got and a link. It'll be yeah, there. I've got highlights. I've got on my I've got the website link and it's got all my stuff on there. Um yeah, man, I love I'm just I love what I'm doing right now, bro. I really do. I love mm. I love being able to do something and not feel like it's about me. It's more about mm. the work, you know, and I mm. love that. I love that so much. Mm. But yeah, that's that's all the plugs for me, Echi. Okay. Plugs for Good me. stuff. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Uh yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadowana la la anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum